Today on Mormon Channel Weekly Edition. From a relative unknown to the top of the music charts to sing with America's choir, this Latter-day Saint has quite the story to tell how David Archuleta is celebrating Christmas. I just love Christmas dinner. I'm a big fan of food. But, uh, <laughs> and what, turkey, uh, ham, a little bit uh, of both? I love turkey. I love the funeral potatoes. I love coming back here and talking about that because whenever I talk about funeral potatoes anywhere else, people are like, what are funeral potatoes? Exactly. Also this week, thousands will attend the annual Mormon Tabernacle Choir Christmas concerts and look back at this incredible tradition. We try to put together our concerts as far in advance as we can because it it really takes a lot of time to put a, a concert of this magnitude together, as you might imagine. Weekly Edition is brought to you by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Here's your host, Kathy Aiken. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mormon Channel Weekly Edition. I'm your host, Kathy Aiken. We have a very special holiday show planned for you today with a very special guest. He's one of the most popular performers of his generation. Utah's David Archuleta began singing as a young boy, winning his first talent competition at age six. In 2008, Archuleta was the American Idol runner-up, earning over 40 million votes. In that same year, his self-titled album went platinum. And one year ago, he became the youngest performer ever to headline the Christmas concert with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And it is our great pleasure to welcome David to Weekly Edition. David, we know you are so busy right now, and we so appreciate you spending some time with us today. Oh, no, thanks for having me. And you're busy right now promoting the beautiful CD from last year's Christmas concert called Glad Christmas Tidings. How fun was that for you to be part of that last year? It was really amazing. Um, it was just especially for me being from Utah, growing growing up here. I, I grew up on uh, listening to music from the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So to be um, from being in the audience um, a few years back when Sissel was the performer to he being was beautiful. Yeah. Oh man, it was amazing. I to being the special guest <laughs> a few years later having no idea what was going to happen in between, but um it was just a really wonderful experience. What did you think when they invited you? What was your first reaction? I I was shocked, I guess. I was really surprised. I I didn't think I was just just surprised, I guess. I don't, I don't know how else to really say it because I know they're. I just felt like, wow, I'm I'm still a teenager, and I'm. Uh, I just, I don't know what to, I didn't know what to think really. Yeah, I, the youngest performer ever, and you know we're so used to hearing you singing pop, but I thought you singing those Christmas songs was such a beautiful change. How do you love? I know you love singing Christmas carols and Christmas songs, don't you? Uh, I do. I think it's. I, I had a Christmas tour a couple years ago, and it was my favorite tour I've. I've gotten to do so that's why I uh, decided to do some more Christmas shows um, this year and uh, just there's a there's just a special feeling in Christmas songs that doesn't exist anywhere else and that's why I love to get to sing them and I think people are willing to listen to them you know uh, everywhere so it's it's cool to be able to sing something that means so much that people will listen to. Did you sing Christmas songs growing up? Was it in your home quite a bit as a boy? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. We we started Christmas caroling when we were young, and um, we, as we got older, we started singing Christmas carols and harmony and, and things, and um, we'd go out and visit different um, hospitals or um, care centers and would put on Christmas shows for, for people as a family, so it was... It was always really f- a fun time of year. David, when you look at the list of past performers, it's it's really quite impressive at the Christmas concert. Sissel, as you mentioned, uh-huh. and Angela Lansbury, Natalie Cole, and then Brian Stokes Mitchell just a few years ago. How is that for you now to have your name on that list and be part of that group? Um, I think it's really special. I think it's uh, just a, a very unique event, especially not be- just because of how big of a, of a Christmas special it is, being PBS's highest highest rated um, annual program on their on all of PBS. I think it's neat to think that it's the kind of extravagant pro- special that it is, and it being um, also being LDS, just the fact that it is the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's event, and to be able to be a part of that, I think it's it makes it even more special to me. I thought one of the most beautiful arrangements that you sang last year was Silent Night, and that's really kind of your personal arrangement, isn't it? Yeah, that was an arrangement that was on my Christmas album that I 
so it was really great to be able to do and for that event and for all that all the people who came you know it's a big audience who comes but it's it's really it was really great to be able to share that um song and that those moments that are in there that i love with uh, other people how do you celebrate christmas with your family what are your share some of your favorite uh, christmas traditions with us um well i for me i just love christmas dinner i love um just being able to you know i'm a big fan of food but uh <laughs> hey, what, turkey uh, ham a little bit uh, of both I love turkey. I love the funeral potatoes, and I love have the those. exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I love. I love coming back here and talking about that because whenever I talk talk about funeral potatoes anywhere else, people are like, "What are funeral potatoes?" Exactly. <laughs> so like, yeah, like so, green jello, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, those and just uh, the fruit salad and things like that are always really good. Will you be home this Christmas? I will be, yeah. So, well, that's the plan, at least. But I, either way, I'll be with my family, which will be great. That's terrific. Well, as we mentioned, one of David's most popular Christmas songs is his version of Silent Night with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Here's a little sample of that incredible number during last year's performance. Jensen and I'm from Kodiak Island, Alaska. And one of my favorite yet simple Christmas traditions is that on Christmas Day, our entire family isn't allowed to leave the house. And uh, it's really special to me that, that I get to spend so much time with my family. It's not something I see every day of the year uh, because we're all pretty busy. of the beautiful numbers of many from last year's performance. And David, now one year later and looking back, what's been the feedback uh, from your performance a year ago? Um, well, it's, it's been really neat to see, uh, you know, whenever I come home, it's, it's surprising to me how many people actually went. Like, that I would... You were lucky to get a would, ticket. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Very hard. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, it's just neat to see, like, all the... All, what people would say and how much it meant to them to be able to come and um, to see how a lot of people were surprised because they weren't expecting me to really do very well with that type of music. But I think a lot of people, I mean, well, I'm known for pop music and, you know, some of my better known songs are the pop songs. Um, 
I mean, before before all of that, I mean, even though I'm an American Idol, I sing songs that were more uh, message oriented and more um, more about the feeling and heart that was in a song and and its melody. And that's how I grew up. I grew up singing that kind of music, so it's always so special for me. That's why I love Christmas music, I guess, is because it allows me to really dig deep into a song and be able to bring out it, uh, do my best to bring out a, the message in the song. I know you said you like to sing soulful music. So is that what you're talking about, those kind of songs? Um, well, I guess th uh, I love singing soulful music in two different ways. There was a time when I was actually into kind of like gospel R&B <laughs> kind of um, music where it's um, where it's more like the... Like soulful, like uh, I, I can't explain. More words like the oh, that kind of stuff instead of just like the church music that we're used to in Utah, uh -huh. I guess. But um, both ways, I, I love that kind of soulful music. Whether it's the soulful kind of um, um, bluesy kind of soulful music compared to the to the um, more reverent um, reverent um, sacred kind of soulful music mm -hmm. uh, where, with like um, Christmas songs and things like that that I would perform. Speaking of the sacred, let's talk about your love of the gospel. I know you are a, a very optimistic person and have great faith. <laughs> have you always been that way? Has that always been part of your being? Um, I think just, I think um, feeling um, close to Heavenly Father um, has always been um, something that I Saw, would always seek after in my life. I, I think when I was younger, of course, I, I, I didn't know how to really keep like, like that relationship that you can have with God going and things like that. But for me, and also just learning like the the teachings and things like that. You know, some of the doctrine would get kind of go over my head and things. You know, all the big words. But when it came to music. It always made sense to me. So um, that's how I really gained my testimony. I mean, I think you, you know, no one can give you your testimony. You have to gain it yourself. You have to um, feel things for yourself, experience things for yourself. And for me, the the way I really found that was with music. Yeah. There's something I felt through music that I didn't feel anywhere else. Um, or, I mean, I couldn't really explain any other any other way, but it just... You know, through, through music, it would just it made sense to me even when I was little. It's like, oh, that's I feel I feel God, like I feel Him, I feel th that Spirit, and it it just made sense to me mm -hmm. like that. Like I didn't, well, I didn't get a lot of other things that just always made so much sense to me. And um, it would be neat to later on, especially on American Idol, people you know all over the world sending letters and things. They would comment on that feeling. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, what they would, I just remember some of these letters just, you know, I always, I never forget them because they would be from people saying, you know, I, I was wondering what that feeling was. I'd never felt it before. Yes, they can't explain it, can they? Yeah. yeah. And there, you know, some people, oh, there are even several letters that would say, you know, I was wondering if you could tell me what it was. And I just thought it was interesting that, that it's like, it just really surprised me. I wasn't mm -hmm. expecting that. But the fact that they could feel the same thing that I felt. And I, I, knew what I, I knew what I felt. I just didn't realize that other people were feeling the same thing without even knowing what it was. Well, music can be so par powerful, can it? Was there a particular hymn or, or gospel song that's really touched you over the years and has helped your testimony? Yes. I, I have to say one of my favorite songs um, would be Be Still My Soul. Mm. It's a song that especially... Um, through some of the more difficult, challenging times where it's like you can feel very alone, um, feel very, like, you know, I um, misunderstood, I guess, too. I, I would just um, happen to hear that song again and think about its lyrics, and it just brought a lot of peace of mind and peace of uh, calming of my heart, I guess, calming my uh, my. my just everything I was feeling, it, I would just feel calmed down and realize, you know what, things are okay, and just uh, it'll be all right. You know, th it's hard right now, but it'll be okay. And it was it really it helped me help me so much. 
You travel all around the world and you talked about the, about the letters that you received. Do you believe that your music is a way of sharing your testimony with others? Um, I do, because I think that's kind of what you do with, I think, music you're able to share. You know, no matter what you're singing about, you, you can express what you believe in. And people can feel what that is. And um, so being able to, you know, I always try to do my best to be selective about what I sing about. And um, making sure I want to, I want to make sure whatever message I'm giving it means something to me. Because I, I want to keep in mind that music does affect, you know, it, it is a powerful tool. And you can go one way with it or you can go the other. And I wanted to make sure that I always... Um, expressed what I loved about it so much to people and I wanted to to do my best um, using it the way I know I knew I was supposed to. Well you're such a great example David really. We'll have much more with David Archuleta in just a moment but first here's another incredible piece from last year's concert one of my favorites Joy to the World. Joy to the world the Lord is come let earth receive a key My name is Adam Fisher and I'm from rural Alaska and every year for Christmas on Christmas Eve we gather together as a family and we read the Christmas story out of the book of Luke. My favorite Christmas gift was the gift for Christmas I received right after my mission, and uh, it was my family because I came home just a few weeks before Christmas. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight over all the earth. He who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Gloria in excess is Deo. Gloria in excess is Deo. If you're just joining us, we're joined today on Weekly Edition with David Archuleta. And David, let's talk about uh, your new album, The Other Side of Down. And I thought it was interesting. You say it was two years worth of introspection and reflection. How so? Um, I guess it was a real opportunity for me to um, be able to say what I wanted to say. I, for, for the time after, especially American Idol, when everything started happening, and a record deal and touring and, and you know fans and things like that, I just was kind of just kind of just getting bounced, you know, <laughs> thrown here and there, and I just didn't even have time to think at all. And I finally was able to take time to think about, okay, what has just happened? <laughs> <laughs> and um, where am I going with myself? Like, what, you know, where do I go now with my life? I, after all this has happened, it's amazing, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. And um, after kind of going through those worries and wondering what I was supposed to do with myself now in my life, and I just realized, you know, we're not we're not supposed to know where we're going. I mean, it's you know, even if you p- try to plan out your life, it always, you know, things always come and change everything. So I just I just wanted to be able to share what I had kind of experienced and say, you know what, I may be kind of clumsy sometimes, or kind of um, may not know where I'm going all the time, but I'm just going to keep moving forward moving ahead and um, putting one foot in front of the other and appreciating my surroundings while I while I have them around me and just taking in everything one step at a time and appreciating and being grateful for it all. But, you know, you just find a way to keep moving even when you don't know where you're going. But you kind of, you kind of feel something inside of you that tells you, you know, it kind of tells you how to keep moving forward and where to go even without knowing what that is. We're almost 21 years of age, and I think it's really remarkable. And actually, I think you're very blessed that 
I think you know why you're here and you know your talent and you're magnifying your talent to help other people. Do you see it that way? Um, I definitely think that, you know, the reason why I have music in my life, the reason why I've been fortunate enough to have music is like, you know, it, I feel like it is such a gift because I've received so much from it and to be able to give it uh, kind of like a, a, as a gift to other people too. Um, it's been amazing to see how much it can do for someone else and it doesn't matter where they're from, who, who they are, how old they are, if, uh, boy or girl or young, old, you know, just how it can, how someone can come up no matter who, who they are and say thank you for what you do. It, it means a lot to me and, um, I really feel like it's a responsibility. I mean, I don't think it's it's like you can I feel like there is a certain duty that you hold with what you're given and what you're able to use in your life. It's like, okay, this is what I have to work with in my life. How am I going to use it to be a benefit to other people? I mean, I definitely get a, I've gotten a lot out of it, but that's not what is satisfying, you know. It's like you you feel like there's still something something more you have to do when you're you keep it to yourself. So to be able to go out and share it, share your experiences and and what you you love with other people, you suddenly realize so much more and realize what I don't know. It's you just realize so much more. <laughs> and I think uh, you have uh, made a difference in uh, more lives than you'll probably ever know in this lifetime, which I think is, <laughs> is such a great credit to you. Your autobiography is called Chords of Strength, a memoir of soul, song, and the power of perseverance. Tell us about that title. How did that come to be? Um, well, I think it was just, uh, it was just kind of reflective on also, I guess the title was also based on the album that I was doing as well, like what my goals were, what I was looking at in my life and thinking about how so much of it is not giving up even when you feel like, you totally feel like giving up and feel like it now is the time to give up because there's nowhere else to go and there's nothing else that you're able to do from this point. But it's a matter of still finding a way to keep moving forward and saying, you know what, this isn't everything. I can feel it. I can sense there's more that I have to do, and I think that's what's bugging me is that I know there's more I have to find and search for. It's just, it's just, a, it's a difficult. But once you're able to find it after the, after the struggle and after the, um, after you know breaking the sweat and going up, <laughs> you know, you you find it, and it's just like wow. I'm just glad I didn't stop because, you know, looking back down the mountain, looking down the path, it's like I almost stopped down there, you know, and I almost stopped a few more times. But look where I am now, even though I felt like stopping all those times, I could have stopped down by the mountain, you know, where, with, and here I am on now look at the view that I have now. Look what look at the new things I can see that I couldn't see before. And I had to keep going, even though I was tired, I was hurting, I was, you know, it was just, you know, I had had enough, but it was so worth it because look, look what's up here now. Yeah, that is such a perfect message for everybody, but I think especially the youth uh, to hear that. Um, you also have such a huge heart, David. You were involved in numerous charitable uh, activities. Do you feel it's a kind of a way for you to pay back or to pay it forward? Yeah, I think... You know, I think it is definitely like a pay it forward kind of thing where it's like, okay, um, I've been able to, you know, I've been able to do a lot in this position and now I'm here in a new position to be able to do other things for other people who, it's like they, especially with kids, I, I love being able to do things with kids where they have so many new opportunities, so many new things for them to learn and they can go this way or that way with um, where they are at in their lives, um, and I just, I just always want to be able to give them the right opportunities so that they can be able to have the opportunity to learn the things I've gotten to learn and more, you know, more than I've gotten to. You know, there, you know, with each generation, we find new things and learn and learn new things, and I just want to be able to help people the way I've been able to be helped. You know, and a lot of people don't have those chances that. 
um, I've been fortunate enough. People here, you know, in our country have been fortunate to have, you know, people who in who don't even have a way of communicating with others or um, getting the right nutrition, getting the right schooling and education, being treated properly. It's like there's so many, there's so many, it's like these kids, you know, they have just as much heart. They have just as much love for doing things. They just need to be given the opportunity to, to, to do it. So I just want to, and I, I learned so much from kids too. I was just talking to um, my brother just the other night, just talking about like, you know, one of the best ways I've learned is from little kids. Yeah, that's who I learned so much from is because they, it's like they're just so pure, they're so excited for life, and they just love so much. And it's like they're the best reminder, one of the best reminders I can have some time of how I should be. <laughs> that is so great. Yeah. David Archuleta, thank you so much, not only for your great example for the talent and all that you share with all of us. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Oh, thank Merry you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, too. Thank you very much. We've spent quite some time talking about last year's beautiful concert, but what about this year's event? When we return, we'll learn all about what you can expect from this year's guests, as well as some of the history behind this incredible feat. The flavor of the show will be a little different. It will be a little bit more classically oriented. Uh, Mac Wilberg would kill me if I gave away any of the surprises, so I can't divulge any of what people will see at the Christmas concert. We'll be right back. My name is Kelsey, and I'm from California. And um, one Christmas tradition that we had growing up was uh, on Christmas Eve, my, my parents would give us one present, and it was always pajamas, but we would always act surprised that we were getting pajamas. And uh, we would put on our, our new Christmas pajamas, and uh, I think that was mostly so that we would look good on Christmas morning for pictures. <laughs> Welcome back to Weekly Edition, brought to you by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today we're talking about the impressive Mormon Tabernacle Choir Christmas concert, which begins this week. But did you know there are 350 other performances taking place throughout the holidays on Temple Square? Each day, sometimes over a dozen performances are performed in places like Assembly Hall, Joseph Smith Memorial Building, the Visitor Center, and the Tabernacle. Choirs, bands, bell choirs, orchestras, and many more are sharing their talents every day. You can find a full list of these performances at lds.org slash events. The Christmas concert tradition at the Conference Center first started in 2000. The first guests were Roma Downey and Gladys Knight. Since then, the choir has performed with such stars as Sissel, Angela Lansbury, Natalie Cole, and Brian Stokes Mitchell. Scott Barrick is the general manager of the choir, and he joins us now. Hi, Scott. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Very good. Yeah, thank you so much. Scott, uh, of course, last year we heard the beautiful voice of David Archuleta. We just ended to, uh, speaking with him. That really brought a new audience for you, didn't it? Well, it was interesting. We had a lot of our uh, same people that came, but they also said, I'm bringing my grandkids this year. So, And we had a, a number of people who uh, maybe w thought that the pairing of the choir and David Archuleta was an interesting one. Uh, Mac Wilberg, the music director of the choir, always could see clear how he wanted to do that and how he thought uh, the, the concert could be put together. And, of course, the result was wonderful. It was beautiful. What types of feedback have you heard since that concert a year ago? You know, uh, it's been billed as our most popular ever. We had, you know, huge requests for tickets and a lot of people that were came uh, standby even without tickets hoping to get in. Uh, so it was, from a, a attendance perspective, it was a wonderful, wonderfully received concert. But I also think that it was uh, a concert that was on a little more popular vein. Mac Wilberg always says that the artists that we have each year as our guests give a flavor to the concert. And, of course, with David, the music was a little bit more popular vein. Some of mm -hmm. it was music that he had recorded before. 
Some of it, um, interestingly, was music that uh, Mac found for David that he just thought was particularly appropriate. It's a little carol called The Cat and the Mouse Carol yes. I'd never heard before, but yeah, it's such an endearing that. little piece. Uh, and it was just absolutely perfect for David. And uh, and then one of the things that David always wanted to do on that concert was um, – to sing a number in Spanish. And so Mac Wilberg found that Los Pastores Abelén, which I think was, it's David perfect. said, is one of his favorite songs on the whole thing. It's got the little mariachi feel and right. a lot of fun to it. So, so uh, and I think the crowd just really appreciated all of that. What was really interesting after the concert was to hear the older people who came, people who, who have been choir fans for a long time, just saying, I just didn't think I would really like it as much as I did. And they just said, I had a wonderful time and I had a great appreciation. So I agree. So it was a I nice think he thing. surprised a lot of the older generation. He, he did a great job. How far in advance do you talk to the performer, Scott? And what's, what's their reaction once they're invited? Well, we try to put together our concerts as far in advance as we can uh, because it really takes a lot of time to put a a concert of this magnitude together, as you might imagine. We try to work at least one or two years in advance. We actually have artists for a couple of future concerts already signed and ready to go, so which gives us great comfort. We have done uh, artists as late as October, November of the year. It's not our preference, but uh, we, we try to plan as far in the future as we can. Now, the majority of the lead performers are not members of the church, but what, what do you hear from them about their experiences with the choir? Uniformly, they just leave with the highest praise for the church, for how they were treated, for the feeling that they have uh, when they've been on Temple Square. Each year after the... Uh, a final concert on Sunday morning with music and the spoken word in the mini concert, we take the artists uh, into the studios here and uh, film them as part of a bonus footage. And we always ask them what it was like to sing in the conference center, how they felt about their experience. The, amazingly, uh, in this auditorium that seats 21,000 people, they almost all say how intimate uh, the feeling is that it doesn't feel like there are 21,000 people out there. It feels like something much smaller. I mean, some of these artists have sung at the Hollywood Bowl, which seats 16 to 17,000 people. And the Hollywood Bowl, you know, goes up the hill forever. Mm-hmm. And it seems like a, a very different environment. So they, they talk about, about the feeling there. Um, Sissel talked about the fact that she felt like she was almost in church when she was in the conference center. So she felt that special feeling that we feel when we attend general conference. So it was really wonderful. Walter Cronkite, when he was here, said that it was probably one of the mountaintop experiences for him, one of the pinnacle of his career. And he wished only that it had happened sooner. And then the interesting thing is that they, they almost all talk about the feeling that they've had here. They, they, they have a sense for the, that there is something underneath the surface, that it's not just about the people. It's not even just about the volunteerism or what people are – that they're giving all of this as a free gift at Christmas time and all through the year. But that, that there's something else and they have a they hard time putting their it, finger on it. Yeah, what a but great they, compliment. Can, but they can feel the feeling. And, uh, of course, we uh, – try to treat them very well. We have um, people, a a senior member of our staff, one of the assistants of the president, Ron Gunnell, who is with our artists really every step of the way from the time after they're they're signed, uh, preparation for their coming here, and then stays with them really almost every minute while they're here. And we have some interesting traditions. We we have a hosting committee in the choir. They're members of the choir, um, principally ladies, but also some gentlemen in the choir. And they put together an amazing gift basket. I mean, this is, you know, if you were to, you, you can't buy these. You, if you were to put it together, it'd be, you know, you know, priceless value. But they put in all sorts of ingenious things and it's waiting in the hotel room when the guests come. Can you give and, us an idea of some of these little things? That oh, get? well, when we had Tom Broca here uh, in September, it wasn't a Christmas concert, but it was the uh, 9-11 special that we did with him. They had found out that he was a fisherman and um, someone had a connection to, uh, a man that that sculpts fish, uh, and I I don't know his name. I wasn't familiar with him, but he's he's quite famous in our local community. And so they had a fish done, and uh, with the idea that they would take it to their vacation home in Montana, which is exactly what they did. They are absolutely thrilled. So you really uh, dig down? He, he, oh dig, yeah, dig deep, they they know you? what what's yeah. happening, and so he, even. Uh, 
after the concert, and Mr. Broca called himself and asked for the the name of the artist. He wanted to call and personally thank him. He wrote a special note to thank for all the the kindness and courtesy that was extended. So, so we do some really interesting things to make the guest artists stay here. Um, just very very memorable. The the last quote um, when Renee Fleming uh, left and before she got on the plane, she turned to Ron Gunnell, who'd been her host, and she said, "No diva anywhere." has been treated any better than I have been treated here. What a compliment. Yeah, Isn't so, that sweet? It was very good. Well, let's talk about this week's performance. We will see British actress Jane Seymour and Nathan Gunn, who is a popular American singer. Tell us a little bit uh, about the two and what type of show we'll see this year, maybe compared to years past. Well, again, as I mentioned, uh, Mac Wilbur's comments are perfectly appropriate because uh, with Nathan Gunn, he's a, he's a crossover artist, but he's principally known in the opera world. Uh, he won a Grammy for his recording of Billy Budd on opera that he did last in 2010. But Nathan can sing anything. And uh, so the flavor of the show will be a little different. Uh, it will be a little bit more uh, classically oriented as opposed to more of the pop orientation that we had last mm-hmm. year with David Archuleta. Uh, and uh, and uh, Mac Wilberg would, would kill me if I gave away any of the surprises. So I can't. I can't divulge any of what what people will see at the Christmas concerts as they come up, but uh, they will see different things. Jane Seymour, of course, will will be doing narration, uh, but it'll be narration that's particularly suited to her and a bit of her British background. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and as, as always, there'll be a few surprises, things that we haven't done before. So we encourage people to come. Yeah, so excited to see it. And tickets, as usual, Scott, are so hard to come by. How many people tried through the lottery this year? Well, we had requests for over a million tickets this year, and. Uh, it was, you know, last year we had requests for over a million and a half. So, and you get, uh, it, and roughly what sixty thousand? Yeah, right? well, we, well, you do four shows, right? Four okay, shows. so roughly so, eighty thousand. Yeah, know, there's eighty four thousand okay. seats that are available. Um, uh, we we have made some changes though uh, in how we we handle our uh, ticketing this year, and I would encourage people to come and stand by. Um, the there the standby line forms every night at uh, six o'clock, um, just to. For those who are listening and uh, maybe attending, all of our concerts will start at 8 this year. Um, we just, sometimes we've started some evenings at 7.30, but each one will start at 8 o'clock. And uh, there may be a chance for people to get in. So if they are, I don't know what the weather will be like, but if they're willing to brave the weather, we'll have seating. Um, uh, you know, it, it, For those fortunate enough to, to get standby mm-hmm. seating in the hall, there'll also be uh, overflow seating in the little theater next to the conference center and in the tabernacle. Uh, and also in the assembly hall. So all combined, there's uh, several thousand seats where even if they couldn't get in the hall, they could watch it on the on the screens. All of those facilities will, be, will have screens, and so they'd have the opportunity of really participating even though they wouldn't be exactly in the hall. Right. Well, for those lucky ones that get in the conference center, it's always an amazing experience to be there. Scott Barrick, thank you so much for all you do with the choir, and best of luck this week as the show begins. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. Mormon Channel Weekly Edition is brought to you by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. To listen to this episode again, or if you'd like a copy for your personal use, please visit us at mormonchannel.org. There you can download this episode, subscribe to our podcast, and listen to many other programs we offer right here on the Mormon Channel. If you have a story you'd like us to cover, please email us at mormonchannel at ldschurch.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. We leave you now with one more song, this one, the Christmas song from Brian Stokes Mitchell, who joined the choir for the 2009 concert. Have a great week. Christmas is here again, got a shot, don't know when, buy the food, deck the halls, wrap the gifts, climb the walls, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Jack Frost nipping at your nose, yuletide carols being sung by the choir, and folks dressed up like Eskimos. Everybody knows a turkey and some mistletoe Help to make the season bright Tiny tots with their eyes all aglow Will find 
be hard to sleep tonight. They know that Santa's on his way. He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh. And every mother's child is gonna spy to see if reindeer really know. Do they really know how to fly? Clean the house, decorate, trim the tree, gain some weight, make a list, fall behind, lose the list, lose your mind. Everything's humming, cause Christmas is coming, and the sand. It's been said many times, many ways. Merry Christmas, a joyful Christmas, not too crazy Christmas. 